thank you all for, for tuning in, particularly if this is uh, a strange hour for all of you. Um, hope all of you are safe wherever you are. And uh, just to make sure, uh, can someone confirm for me that I'm, I'm audible? And okay, my slides seem to be up now. Um, okay, I assume that uh, everything is, uh, is clear on the audio end of things. Um, uh, Susie, I see that my um, my video thumbnail seems to be blocking a part of the slide. Is that something we can move? <clears throat> I don't see it blocking on my end. What I would recommend is maybe I can zoom in or out on the WebEx, um, but unfortunately, I don't think that I can move your your icon. Okay. 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 Cool. Uh, that's, that's fine. Uh, if if that's a problem, I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll try and manipulate it every now and then. Okay, great. So, uh, so this is kind of like the grand finale of the the, the, the technical part of the school, right? I mean, we've uh, we've basically covered um, you know uh, a, a great deal of discussion on quantum hardware so far, and and you've been introduced to a host of different quantum algorithms, um, uh, including an algorithm to address um, stuff in, in, in chemistry. Um, and uh, as an experimentalist, um, I, I kind of wanted to give you guys some idea of how these two tie together. Okay, how does, how does the performance of the hardware um, affect the performance of an algorithm that you want to run? Um, you know, you, you, you've, you've also looked at algorithms that are, that are geared towards um, Fault tolerant quantum computers, um, quantum computers with with uh, with error correction, and, and that's also something you've you've dived into. But what kind of algorithms are geared towards noisy quantum systems, the systems you can access um, uh, today over say, the quantum experience? Okay. And another aspect of this that I also want, want to motivate is 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 for you guys to think about why do we even have quantum hardware available on the cloud? Um, I mean, most of the labs, for instance. Um, uh, you know, have involved you guys running experiments using the simulators, and this is um, an extremely um, uh, useful tool to get a sense of, of of the kind of things that happen and, and how 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 circuits are run and and and, and so on. Um, but then there's also a great deal of learning, um, you know, from from running on actual devices, and, and that's also something I I want to begin to give you guys a feel for. It's it's obviously um, not not easy to to grasp all of this in three hours, but but I think if you can walk away with a bit of a feel for for the different considerations one makes um, with our hardware, um, um, that's that's very helpful when you, when you try and run um, algorithms. And uh, just just looking at Susie's announcement about about the lithium hydride project, I mean it's pretty amazing uh, that that what was research a couple years ago. <laughs> Um, is now uh, basically a project that that so many of you are 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 attempting, and, and this this is really um, unusual and very exciting that, 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 that the transition from from a research project to an education project. And uh, so I hope you find you guys find this um, this useful. Okay, so let's take a, a trip down the memory lane. Uh, you know, perhaps in high school or college, um, you've stared at at molecules like this. Um, and uh, maybe you might have asked, well, why, why this arrangement? You know, why this, this specific distance between, between atoms? Why this angle? Okay? Um, and, and these are all very relevant questions, right? Um, and essentially, if, if you try and go back to a, a simpler molecule, uh, just uh, an example of a diatomic molecule, all of these questions really come down to, you know, the, the potential energy curve. Um, okay, um, so so what I mean by that is, well, imagine that you had this 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 case of just two atoms. Um, um, when they're extremely close to each other, you have this configuration with high energy. Um, if you if you bring them at a distance that refers to the bond distance, uh, um, you're now in the equilibrium position. Um, and now, if you if you take them far apart, uh, they're essentially dissociated. Okay, so there isn't any interaction between the atoms anymore. 
And this minima in the energy, this lowest energy state is the equilibrium state. And this defines the bond distance. This is going to define the bond angle. Uh, and, and this is going to define the arrangement of atoms in a molecule. Okay, this lowest energy state. And this is very important. Okay. Um, essentially, this energy delta E represents a dissociation energy, the energy required to, to break, um, uh, break the bond. Um, um, so you can also call it the binding energy. Um, <clears throat> and essentially, if you, if you wanted to, if you were interested in a, in a chemical reaction rate, then, then that rate is going to be exponentially sensitive to, um, to that delta E, okay, to that binding energy, the amount of energy it requires to break, break that bond. Um, and so then one, and then, then of course, because, because this, is, this is defining reaction rates, this is, this is going to be important for, for insights also into reaction pathways. And if you have some, some novel chemistry you want to, you want to understand or study, um, uh, then, then, then this, this is going to be very important for a host of scientific and industrial endeavors, right? Um, so the question I can then ask is, how do you access this delta E? How do you access this energy to very high accuracy? Um, well, one approach could be just do an experiment, okay? You could, you could just run an experiment and, and perhaps measure it. Um, and, and having to do this for every molecule you're interested in can be a very time-consuming and expensive task. Uh, but a more efficient approach could be to simulate it, right? And, and, and to simulate this, we need some kind of, you know, some framework, some laws that are expected to describe the behavior of the system very well, okay? And for this, we have the laws of quantum mechanics, right? Um, which we know um, uh, explains a lot of phenomena at the, at the microscopic level very well. So yesterday, um, with my friend Antonio Mazzacapo, you've, you've seen Hamiltonians like these, energy operators, um, which describe uh, the, the kinetic energy of the electrons, uh, the Coulomb interaction between pairs of electrons and pairs of nuclei, um, and, um, and the Coulomb interaction between pairs of electrons again. Right? Um, and this, this is the electronic Hamiltonian under uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which means that we've assumed the nuclei to be um, um, the, the, the nuclei to be stationary essentially. Okay, um, and, and 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 so we have we have we can express a Hamiltonian in this form. We have to basically solve Schrodinger's equation, um, and we have this entire framework of of, of quantum mechanics, right? Uh, but even in the 1930s, uh, you know, Dirac already identified that, that having to solve um, Schrodinger, you know, Schrod having to solve these equations exactly, and, and I'm going to use the word exact very often, and, and by that I mean, uh, you know, to no approximation, solving these equations is going to be a very hard task, okay? Um, so, so what does this actually, what are we solving? We're basically solving an eigenvalue problem here, okay? Given a Hamiltonian, we want to know what the lowest energy is and, and what is the lowest energy state, okay? Um, and um, you, you, you've, you've seen yesterday how you can basically have a matrix representation uh, of this Hamiltonian. Um, and, and essentially, it amounts to, to diagonalizing that matrix. Okay? Um, so why is that very hard? Because the size of that Hamiltonian scales as 2 to the n by 2 to the n. Okay? Um, and, 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 and so the size of that matrix scales uh, scales exponentially right and 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 this is this, this we know is 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 going to be hard so how does and you know how have okay the, the discussion of using quantum computers for quantum chemistry perhaps for many of you has been much more recent so how has any chemistry been done so far it's basically because people have come up with very good approximations to problems and there are a host of approximations you know applicable for different sets of chemistry problems that work really well okay but then there are also examples which are always going to be inaccessible to the world's most powerful supercomputers. Okay? Um, and and this, this was seen by Feynman. Okay? And, and, and he really asked this question in the 80s, which would set off um, this field. Can we build uh, a, a well-controlled programmable quantum system to simulate the properties of, of other natural quantum systems, okay? like, like molecules? Okay? And, and, 
this was really the motivation for quantum computing. Uh, and, and the development of the fields kind of, you know, took a detour with Shor's algorithm and quantum error correction, supremely important topics that you've covered uh, already. Um, but today, these programmable quantum systems exist. You know, you can access them through the cloud, through the quantum experience, and, and we, we're calling, we call them quantum computers, right? And, and this is an example on the right of, uh, of, of one programmable quantum system uh, that you're familiar with, um, made up with transmons, okay? um, which one can really think of as, uh, as, as artificial atoms. Um, and and this, this comparison works really nicely. You have a network of artificial atoms on the right, uh, which you want to use to, to simulate networks of real atoms okay, on the left. Um, what, one thing I'll emphasize, though, is, is note the difference in, 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 in length scales. Okay? This, is, this is a length scale of, of an angstrom, or less than a nanometer, uh, 10 to the minus 9. And here, the length scale is about a millimeter. Okay? It's something we can see with our eyes. And, and this, is, this is really very interesting uh, and, you know, and, and kind of highlights how, how the behavior of, of the chip on the right is, is a wonderful example of macroscopic quantum phenomena. You know, we often think of, of, of quantum mechanics um, um, you know, describing very well the behavior of subatomic particles, electrons, protons, and so on. But it also does a very good job at describing macroscopic effects. And, and, and um, um, superconducting circuits are a very good example of, of something like this. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so I, I spoke of, of well-controlled and programmable. Well, well how, do we, how do we control quantum states? How do we program this? Um, uh, at this point, perhaps in your sleep, many of you can, can, can explain uh, a, a, a block sphere. Uh, and, and basically, you're, you're performing computations here by, by, by performing rotations um, over the surface of a block sphere. Okay? And, and this idea can essentially be extended to to, to n qubits, where you're performing rotations in this extremely large two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, um, so then the question arises: Well, how do you how do you perform these rotations? Um, what was shown by uh, David De Vincenzo in the very early days of the field was that for for any 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 such rotation can be can be decomposed into into much smaller and more accessible operations. This is also a concept you're familiar with at this point, right? Um, uh, with a universal gate set, you know, with a set of single qubit rotations and just two qubit gates, gates that entangle pairs of qubits only, you can perform any rotation in this in this large Hilbert space. Okay, and this really this really simplifies things tremendously. Um, um, uh, the, the fact that you only need to really worry about having operations or gates. Um, um, between pairs of qubits, um, and and this sequence, this decomposed sequence of 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 more accessible operations, that's what you see in that figure. That this is an example of a quantum circuit. Okay, um, so well, what's the catch now? You know, this, this this is this is really nice that you can do everything with just single qubit and two qubit operations. Um, the catch is that in in a real physical system, each of these operations. Um, so in the blue, I'm 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 referring, I'm, I'm symbolizing these two qubit uh, operations. In the red are the single qubit rotations. Um, and uh, the catch is that each of these uh, take a finite amount of time. Each of these operations take a finite amount of time. And uh, over the duration of the circuit, they're basically, uh, so over time, there's basically an accumulation of error. Okay. Um, and uh, this is going to mean that your, 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 your quantum computation is going to have error. And, and, and the only known solution to this conundrum is basically quantum error correction. And that's something you've, you've studied because it's so important. And, and this is the only real path forward to, 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 to fixing these errors. Um, well, but that's not something that's immediately accessible to us. Uh, uh, systems that you have available and you know, systems that people run experiments on today are all noisy. Um, and uh, basically, uh, while you've, 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 you've learned about algorithms like Shor's algorithm, which are, which are geared 
you know, towards a fault tolerant uh, a system with quantum error correction. What's been uh, a more novel phenomena is, uh, you know, looking into algorithms um, focused on uh, on what are called short depth circuits, circuits that are not too long. So the accumulation of error is something we can we can manage and we can we can work with. Okay, um, and um, so with that, uh, perhaps I can take a few questions. I know we've just started, but the next thing I'm going to kind of get into is is a quick recap of the hardware. And we're going to connect that to, um, 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 to, to the kind of errors that one deals with and how they affect um, the performance of algorithms, specifically in the context of molecular simulation. Um, Hi there, Abhinav. So you're, you're ready to take some questions? Uh, I think so. Yeah, we, we, could take a, we could take one or two and then. Perfect. There's a, there's a question that's getting, uh, looks like, quite a few upvotes. Uh, so we'll ask that one first. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, we learned about mapping from fermions to qubits. Is there a mapping from bosons to qubits? Ah, okay. Uh, so this, 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 this seems to be much uh, a more recent research topic, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, this isn't something I would get into right away. Um, but, but yes, people are, are, are thinking of this in the context of quantum simulation. Um, you know, from Feynman's original idea, uh, it, it isn't necessarily only the you know the simulation of fermionic systems uh, uh, that one would be interested in. Um, so there, there is this is this is a very good question and and uh, an area of ongoing research, if I may. Cool. Okay. Um, and let's go to the next highest upvoted question: Are the symmetries? conserved independently of the mapping, parity B through K, Jordan Wigner? Uh, are the symmetries conserved? Independently of the mapping. Ah, um, so, uh, so, so, so there are some geometric symmetries which, 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 will, which will translate independent of the mapping. Um, for instance, if you had a diatomic molecule, um, you know, then you have this, this rotational symmetry along uh, right along the center, um, um, but but what those? We, let, let, let's let's get into that a little later, perhaps, and then I can I can readdress that question again. Okay. okay, no problem. Do you have time for one more, or should we just keep moving? Um, I could take one more. That's okay. Okay, cool. So, in the VQE procedure, how do we measure the expectation value of each unitary term in the decom? the decomposition of the Hamiltonian? Ah, lovely question. We're going to spend yeah. half an hour on it today, if not more. Okay? Uh, okay. So, so we'll get back to that as well. All right, no worries. We can come back to these. It seems like they're, they're, they're already ahead of you. So I think yeah. we'll, we'll stop the questions for now. Sure. Um, people, please continue to, to upvote, and it looks like we'll get to some of these in a little bit. Cool. All right. Um, okay, so... Um, Quick recap and uh, of the hardware. So you've all been introduced to the transmon, which is essentially an artificial atom that uh, has been engineered by circuit design. And uh, the transmon is basically composed of a very special junction um, that's shown in the circle and blown up on the right. This is called the Josephson junction, um, and it's shunted by these large capacitor pads. The you know what what you see in in purple. And uh, basically, uh, th this can be modeled essentially as an LC resonator. Um, uh, and, and, and this junction, which is basically a sandwich of, of an insulator between, uh, between two superconductors. So here, in this example, the superconductors are aluminum. And then you have some aluminum oxide, which is, which is the, the, the insulator in the middle. Um, so, th so this junction has some interesting nonlinear properties. Um, and um, as a result of which, um, what would have been a harmonic oscillator energy spectrum with equally spaced levels um, develops some, some nonlinearity. It, it, it develops some anharmonicity. And what I mean by that is that the spacing between the levels is now different. Um, and as a result of that, you can basically use these two lowest levels as the, the levels of the qubit. Right, and this is this is something you've you've already been introduced to. Um, 
So now by shining light at the qubit frequency, at this frequency, you can basically have population exchange now between, uh, between the zero and one state. And this, I also believe, is something you've done in the lab. Um, you've looked at Rabi oscillations, um, right? Um, and uh, you can then define uh, a pulse time and amplitude that, that uh, corresponds to a pi rotation, a rotation from the zero to the, to the one. Um, um, and and that, that's something we're going to call a pi pulse. You can also have uh, uh, a pulse or uh, a time and amplitude that takes you to a superposition state. And this is, this is um, going to be a pi over 2 pulse, right? and that's going to correspond to a point here. So in this figure, basically the, the, the time of the pulse has been kept fixed, and we're sweeping the amplitude um, um, of, uh, of that pulse. Um, but essentially, um, this is your block sphere representation once again. Um, the amplitude or the duration of the pulse um, is, is, is going to control the total angle of rotation. Okay, I defined for you a pi over 2 and a pi, and a pi pulse, but essentially you can, have, um, you can have any other arbitrary rotation um, depending on, on the pulse amplitude. Uh, and then there's the question of, well, which axis do you rotate about? Um, and, and that can also be controlled by, by the phase of the pulse, okay? Um, okay, so this is, this is single qubit operations, and this is, this is very nice uh, uh, and easy to study and visualize. Uh, but really, what's at the heart of quantum computation are these entangling keys, okay? Uh, a computation with, with only single qubit rotations would be efficient to simulate, uh, uh, simulate classically. And for these entangling operations, what I already emphasized is um, uh, you, it's sufficient for us to have basically these operations between just pairs of qubits. So two qubit entangling gates are sufficient. And this is also something we can do. I don't think this has been dived into too much. Um, uh, but essentially, there's operations which, which work on product states. And they will create states that can't be factored into uh, the individual qubit components, okay? So what I mean by that is consider a state like this, um, where qubit A has been placed in a superposition, qubit B is in, a, in, its, in its ground state, in its, in its zero state, um, and then you perform uh, an entangling operation, which is basically a conditional rotation, okay? Which means that you perform rotations on one qubit conditioned on the state of the other. So in the context of a C0 gate or a Cx gate, what this means is you will flip um, the, 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 the state of one qubit, which we're going to call the target qubit, conditioned on, 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 on whether a control qubit is in the zero or the one. So in this context, um, you will have a next rotation, which is basically a, a flip from zero to one. Um, on, on qubit B, um, whenever qubit A is in the one. Okay, And so if you do that, what you end up with is a is a state 0, 0, plus 1, 1. And this is now an example of a state that can't be factored into its individual components. Okay? So this is, um, uh, these are the kind of operations one wants to achieve. Um, and and this, is, this is also something we can, um, uh, we can, we can do with, with, with our hardware. Okay? And this is also something you can do on, on processors that are accessible via the cloud. Uh, uh, let me not get into too many details, but uh, you know, essentially this can be done by by coupling qubits. And and here is an example of of qubit one, uh, one transmon coupled to another, and um, and and these are are coupled via uh, a coplanar waveguide resonator, okay, which is also something you've been introduced to. And essentially, with with just microwave pulses, with, with pulses much like a uh, very similar to um, our, our, our single qubit control, but at a different frequency, um, you can generate these entangling gates, okay? Um, and uh, uh, what, what you've also been introduced to, uh, these, these coplanar waveguide resonators, um, this is uh, also relevant for, for measurement, for qubit measurement, and this is also a topic that you've been introduced to, okay? Um, so basically, when, when you have a resonator coupled to a qubit, 
um, the the resonator frequency is is dependent on the state of the qubit. And 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 some of you have might have seen this in the context of of B dagger B uh, creation and annihilation operators. And this 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 expression is basically in the in the two level approximation. So so defining um, uh, the the transmon as a perfect qubit. Okay. Um, so basically, this this figure here describes what that equation is trying to say: is is you have one resonator frequency um, here in the red um, when the qubit's in the zero state, and then you have the blue when the qubit's in the one state. So if you instead park your frequency at at say this peak, um, and then you probe the transmission, um, you'll have high transmission if um, if you're in the in the zero uh, and low transmission in the one. And this is this is this is a way in which you can you can measure the state of your qubits, okay? Um, and now, so if, if this has all been motivating enough for you guys to check out the kind of hardware that is accessible, uh, this is an example of a five qubit device. Uh, and uh, uh, a five qubit device that's, that's fairly dear to me. I mean, we've had two very important papers running on, on this specific device. Um, and um, this this figure here on the left, uh, you know, shows the the coupling between pairs of qubits that is basically achieved by these coplanar waveguide resonators. You can see that each of these qubits has its own um, CPW resonator. This is going to be for for measurement of the qubit, and then you have these nice graphics that 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 help you visualize very quickly. Um, um, you know, what are the error rates? And this is something I'll I'll get into very quickly, um, but uh, uh, this is also something I'd, I'd like you to, to begin to familiarize yourself with when you see pictures like this. For instance, I mean, this is an example of a five qubit device. And, um, you know, say you want to run an experiment on a subset of these. Um, images like these are, are, are meant to clarify to you, well, what kind of, um, uh, or, or which, which pair of qubits would I use for the computation, okay? So if you actually went in and clicked on this, this download calibrations, you'll see a lot more data, okay? And uh, th this isn't meant to confuse you. Uh, this is just, just to give you a sense of the breadth of information that you have about these devices. And uh, what we're going to do for, uh, you know, very soon is, is get into what all of these different uh, uh, terms mean and how they're going to then connect to um, the, the efficiency of, or, or the accuracy of a chemistry simulation, okay? So yeah, as I was saying, uh, you know, given calibration data like this, um, if, if you had to use, say, only two qubits for the simulation of a hydrogen molecule, which two would you use? This is, this is the kind of sense uh, I'd like you guys to develop, okay? Um, yeah, so then just focusing on one row um, to, to make things a little more simple, um, we have something called T1 and T2, um, and these are uh, representative of, of times over which one loses quantum information. I'll, I'll define these a little better. But basically, they're on the order of tens of microsecond to 100 microsecond, OK? Um, um, I, I might have used uh, the, the term microwave pulses already. And this is basically because of, of this frequency range, OK? This, this about 5 gigahertz corresponds to the 0, 1 transition frequency um, for our um, um, for, for many of the transmon qubits, okay? Um, you have about uh, uh, two to 3% error uh, on the measurement. Um, so I will use measurement and readout interchangeably. Um, the single qubit error rates are, are, are very good. Um, you know, the, the gates are better than 99.9%. Um, so this is about 0.1%. Um, uh, and then, the C naught, so these are the two qubit entangling gates. These are more error prone, and these are about one percent. Okay, and this is all going to, um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll dive into all of this very soon. Um, so that now gets me into the discussion of of hardware errors. Um, I could take maybe one question, Susie. Sorry, I, I should have prompted you a little earlier, but um, if there's one that's related to our discussion so far, the recap. Uh, I'm happy to take it.
Abhinav, are we ready for some questions? Yeah, yeah. If, if there is uh, maybe, maybe one question that we have on the hardware recap, that might be. Uh, yeah, it seems like they're still asking about VQE procedure. Um, okay. I have a upvoted question. It says, in the VQE procedure, um, how do we measure the expectation value of each unitary term in the decomposition of the Hamiltonian? This is the question that we had before. Should we right. put it up until later? Yes, please. I think okay. that's what we'll do. Okay. Um, let's, so see let's, yeah. let's see if there's a relevant uh, one for now. Um, is there any metric that can assist us to identify an effective circuit that represents the solution space well while maintaining a low circuit depth and number of parameters? Oh, great question once again. <laughs> but, but you guys are all ahead of me. Uh, that's very <laughs> all good. All right, we can, we can pause them and come back to them if yeah. that's best. Yeah. Okay. Cool. It's all very good. Great questions, everyone. Yeah, yeah great questions. It, it also uh, kind of conveys how much you've grasped from yesterday's lecture. It's excellent. Um, okay. So, um, errors on hardware. Um, I'm going to uh, characterize them in, in, in four uh, buckets. Okay, um, incoherent errors, uh, leakage, coherent errors, and then measurement errors. Okay, so um, the first up, uh, we'll talk about energy relaxation, and I, I spoke of something called the T1 time. Um, and essentially, what this is a measure of is if you initialize your qubit in the one state. Okay. Um, if if you uh, if, if you're you know by 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 applying uh, a pi pulse, and then you you basically wait for different amounts of time after you apply that, and then you measure. Okay, uh, and and what that'll give you is it'll give you a, a decay like the curve you see on the right. Okay, so starting out um, in you know the probability of one something close to one, um, it's going to decay out to zero when when the cube when the qubit finally decays back uh, into its ground state. And to this, this exponential decay, you can have a fit, and then this associated time scale is called the T1 time. And, and this is something you will come across a lot uh, as, you, as you dive into this, this field much more. Okay? Um, and this time is really a measure of how quickly does the qubit lose its energy. Um, and uh, uh, you know, th this can be because of, of a host of different reasons, you know, because of defects that are on your chip, because of, uh, of, of cosmic radiation. There, there are a whole host of reasons why this, this happens. Um, um, and the other relevant time scale then is, is something called T2, which is addressing dephasing. Okay, so if you, if you prepare um, your, your qubit in a superposition state, Okay, and this you can do by a pi over two pulse. So that's it's a pi over two rotation. Um, it, it's a measure of how quickly does um, uh, a qubit lose its phase coherence. So so once it's in that superposition state, you know over time it's going to to evolve and and, and lose its phase information. Um, so so the experiment you do there is is you 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 initialize in the superposition. You wait for a certain amount of time. You try and bring the qubit back to its original state, and then you measure. Um, and, uh, uh, and 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 then you you're going to measure a decay once again, and you can you can fit an associated time scale, and that's that's going to be T two, okay. Cool. So uh, to give you a sense of of the coherence budget and the different time scales involved, okay. Um, the single qubit gates that I spoke about, uh, pi pulses, pi over two pulses, they can be done in order tens of nanoseconds, okay. Um, and, and that's why they have a very tiny little length uh, in this figure. The two qubit gates are a little longer in time, um, and those are going to be on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. Okay, um, and then uh, the T1 and T2 times they're going to be on the order of tens of microseconds. You know, maybe even hundred microseconds, typically on many of the devices that are available. Uh, so this this figure really gives you a sense of how many of these gates can you fit into this entire coherence window, you know, this approximate time scale over which you lose all your quantum information, okay? Um, and uh, the, the longer that time, the better, the longer circuit depth you can have for your, uh, you know, for, for your algorithms and so on. Um, and, and the good news is that when the, the first superconducting qubits were, were developed, um, 
uh, uh, two decades ago, uh, the coherence times we had there, the T1, T, the, the, the T2 times in particular that you had there were, were basically on the order of a nanosecond. So even smaller than this. Okay, so the, the community has made tremendous uh, progress, you know, um, you know, improvements over orders of magnitude to get it to this point. And, and, and you'll also see examples of, of, of coherence times on, on certain qubits on the order of a millisecond and so on. And, and, and the hope is this only gets, gets better here on and, and, and enables much more complex com quantum computation. Okay, so um, uh, you, you have this, this, this finite window. Okay, one approach one could take is, well, if I want to fit in more gates in this, in this blue window, can I make each of these gates even shorter? Okay, um, and I hope that that question has, has, has come across, um, um, you know, it's something you, you, some of you have wondered about. Um, and the limit to that is leakage, okay? So a transmon is not a perfect qubit. Uh, you have the lowest energy states, which, which we want to you use for, the, for, the, for quantum computation for zero and one, but then you also have these higher energy states and in particular, uh, the next state, the two state, is only about 330 megahertz, um, you know, different from, um, from the zero one transition, okay? So the zero one was about five gigahertz, right? And this is about 0 0.3 gigahertz, okay? And this can, can basically affect, and this can place a limit on your gate speed. And why is that? So if you had a square pulse like this, if you look at the Fourier transform of the square pulse, you're going to have all these different um, you know, frequency components in there, which means that although you intended to drive just the zero one, you also end up exciting uh, the one two. Okay? And this means you're leaking out of your computational space. Uh, and this is something that you definitely don't want. You want to be operating only in the zero one um, computational space. So um, one one way to one game to play is well you can you can do some very simple pulse shaping from from square pulses you can go to Gaussian pulses and then if you look at the Fourier trans transform of that then that's that's much narrower uh, and then you can so basically you can suppress a lot of uh, you know the frequency components beyond uh, the frequency that you care about right um, so pulse shaping becomes important uh, and these are all games that you can play with with, with tools like Open Pulse that you've been introduced to. Okay, um, so this, this this is an important limitation for gate speed, um, uh, particularly in the transmon, uh, the transmon game. Okay, um, then there are examples of of coherent errors. Um, uh, so looking at a Rabi oscillation like this, I was talking about um, um, uh, you know population transfer from from the zero to the one. Okay, and then you would define this this amplitude, or perhaps this dotted line, as the amplitude that corresponds to a, a pi pulse. Oops. Okay. Um, what if I calibrated that angle to be slightly wrong? What if I chose that angle instead? What that's going to mean is that for every, you know, for every rotation I do, there's going to be an epsilon error. Okay. Um, so these are examples of of uh, of coherent errors, you know, under rotations or over rotations. So you intended to do a ninety degree rotation, but you actually did an eighty nine point five or uh, ninety point five, you know. Um, and 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 one way to study these is by repeating the pulses. For instance, in this example, you have a pi over two, so you intended to bring it along the equator, but you have this epsilon error. Uh, but if you then do this repeatedly, you can essentially amplify. Uh, so if, if you do it two more times here, now your 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 vector is along this direction, um, is, is along is along here, uh, and then you've you've increased the error to, to three epsilon, then five epsilon, and so on. Um, and uh, so this is one way to to study these kinds of of, of over and under rotations. Okay. Um, cool. And then finally, there's this measurement error. Okay. You you intended to measure the zero. Um, uh, but what, or, or rather, you were you were measuring the zero state, but you picked up some some counts for one. Um, so basically, what you typically get um, out of uh, a circuit that you run are counts. Okay, you you get if you repeat a circuit hundred times, 
you know, you get you get a hundred counts, um, and and some of those are going to be zeros, and some of those are going to be ones. And even if you had you know prepared uh, only a zero state, uh, and you intended for all those counts to be just zeros, you might get some of these ones. And and this can you know this can this can happen for a host of reasons. This can be associated with uh, you know the the line width uh, of these peaks and the separation. Uh, this can also be a consequence of, of you know, for instance, some energy relaxation during the course of the measurement pulse. Um, and and so, for instance, here in this, this very crude example, you know, if 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 you got uh, for for a zero, uh, if if you got a one percent error, um, you know, measuring ones, and then you you, you know, if you prepared a one state and you got a five percent error measuring the zero, uh, then then you take the average, and then you would say that the measurement fidelity. Uh, is about 97% in this scenario. Okay, and this is also going to be important. This also affects the performance of um, of our um, uh, of our chemistry algorithms.